قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to our Saturday episode of Ask Zad coming to you after Maghrib prayer in Mecca As usual we'll take three questions from the emails A Muslim says I know that playing musical instruments is not allowed in Islam. Is it also not permissible for small kids to play musical instruments? The answer is yes. It is prohibited for the grown-ups, the parents, the teachers, to allow the children who are not accountable to play musical instruments because this is haram. Yes, the children will not be sinful because they are not accountable, but we as grown-ups are and will be held accountable because we allowed them to do something haram. Similarly, if a child were to drink some wine or to smoke or to do haram things, he's not accountable. But it's our sin for not preventing such haram from being committed. And uh, um, similarly, when lots of the parents would put gold jewelry on their boy child. And we see this with the newborn. So a child that is a month or two old, his parents bring or receive a gift of Ayat al-Kursi in a golden uh, um, uh, necklace. And they make the child wear it. The child is not sinful, but the parents are. Abu Mahdi says, Surah An-Nisa, verse 78 says, good and bad both are from Allah. But the following verse 79 says, good is from Allah and bad is from us. What do these verses really mean? If you go to the Quran, you will find that these two verses are back to back. And it cannot contradict, the Quran cannot contradict, let alone have any conflict between two verses back to back. So Allah says in the Quran, what translates to the meaning, when something good befalls them, they say, this is from Allah. But when something evil befalls them, they say, this is from you. Say, O Prophet, both have been destined by Allah, which means that they attribute evil things happening to them, to the Prophet ﷺ, as a bad omen. So if there's an earthquake, this is all because of you, meaning that you brought this bad omen to us. Allah says, this is all from Allah, meaning the creation and the ordainment, the predestiny of it. This is from Allah, good or bad. It's Allah who created it. It's Allah who uh, preordained and predestined it 50,000 years before creating the creation. Now, the following verse says, Whatever, um, what comes to you of good is from Allah. But what comes to you of evil, O man, and the most authentic is, O prophet, because this is addressing the prophet, is from yourself, and we have sent you, O Muhammad, to the people as a messenger, and sufficient is Allah as witness. What does that mean? It means that it is permissible to attribute events to the causes. So if someone has an accident and the mechanics say the accident was due to faulty brake pads. Would it be sinful to say, oh, the accident happened because the brakes didn't work? Or should I say the accident did not, did, uh, the accidents took place because Allah preordained it and it was distant. It, yeah, it is. But what caused it? It's the faulty breaks. So attributing to things or events to the causes is totally permissible from 
this ayah and there is no shirk in it. There is nothing wrong in it. So now I hope it's clear that the difference between the two verses is when the idol worshippers attributed evil things to the Prophet ﷺ, this is not because he was the cause of it, rather because they believe that it's bad omens and he's the cause of it. And Allah said to them, no, everything is created by him Azza wa Jal and everything was predestined by him Azza wa Jal. But when someone falls sick, or a calamity takes place, or deaths occur. This is because of my own flaws and shortcoming as the cause of it, yet it was created by Allah and predestined by Allah. And I hope this answers your question. And the final question is from Adam. What are the qira'at? I've heard some atheists say there are seven versions of the Quran with extra words or different pronunciations, therefore, the Qur'an isn't preserved. Is this true, Sheikh? First of all, there are seven ahruf. And these are different from the qira'at. Ahruf are the ways that the Qur'an was revealed in, where the, some words may differ, though having the same meaning, or some words may differ having an alternative meaning that adds more value to the verse. Now, the Prophet himself said to us, as some, that Jibreel came to me, the archangel, and he gave me the Quran in one harf, in one way. It's not a, a dialect, it's not an accent, it's a way. Like Ibn Mas'ud says, when you say to someone, uh, come, or uh, uh, get here. It's the same meaning, different words. So these ahruf, these ways, in the beginning they were one. The Prophet said, I ask him for more and more and more until he gave me seven. Now, can we identify the seven? The answer is no. No one can. Why? Because the Prophet did not tell us this these are seven ahruf. And they were given to us as a lump sum. Port, this is point one. Now, the most important point is, do you agree that the Quran is a divine revelation from Allah? Box number one checked. Do you agree that Allah pledged upon himself to preserve the Quran? Box number two checked. Do you agree that the whole Muslim Ummah for the past 15 centuries never doubted the Quran and agreed upon the, the, the Quran that we have with the different ahrufs in it? The answer is yes and check for box number three. Now, where is the fault here? The fault is in our own understanding. The fault is when we listen to the enemies of Islam who are trying to cast doubts in our religion over something that is crystal clear. Someone comes to you and says, your father is not your real biological father. Would you go and do a DNA test? Of course not. I wouldn't believe whatever someone comes and says to me, which I'm totally confident of, let alone about my own religion that is false proof. It's perfect. 15 centuries, people are increasing. Facts are coming up to prove that it is the ultimate religion and it's divine religion from Allah Azza wa So I wouldn't allow these things to infiltrate my conviction in Iman and cast doubt over my Iman of the Quran. So how to explain? There is no need to explain, Akhi. The Prophet himself said that he requested seven ways of recitation. It was given to him. Now, at the time of Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, he rewritten the Quran, compiled it on one way of these ahruf, and that is the way of Quraysh, the dominant language, which was prevailing all over the country. 
And he made sure that there were no dots or vowels used to include and incubate the other six ahruf in it. And the whole ummah agreed upon it and accepted it. And the, those who have knowledge, those who are the elite, who have knowledge in the Qur'an's recitations, can tell you some of the examples which are like one in every 1,000 words, or maybe more. One word in every 1,000 words that may be written differently, meaning the same, or written differently with a different meaning that adds value to the ayah when you read the interpretation or the tafsir of it. Now the seven qira'at, these are totally different than the ahruf because this is what was compiled by seven scholars like two, three centuries later on, each one having a different accent or dialect in reciting the Quran. The most prominent that is worldwide, Hafs an Asim. This is the prominent, but there's Warsh uh, 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 an and there are different types which very few of the scholars of the Qira'at know. But it is all there, it's documented, it's different than the Ahruf, and I hope this answers your question. Uh, Nasra from the US. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamualaikum. And my mom, my brother, and I are going to go check out a school for us to enroll in, inshallah. But I think they need to like scan your hand to uh, enter, uh, like uh, to check your temperature. So can I take off my glove a little bit to let the guy, to let the person scan my hand? Jazakallah khair. No problem, inshallah. This is for necessity. Uh, Rizwan from Bangladesh. Rizwan. Um, Hamza from Bosnia. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. My question is the following, Sheikh. So most of my relatives are approximately 15 to 20 kilometers away from me. And when I go to visit them with my parents, they always serve alcohol on the table. They drink it and there's also free gender mixing. I understand that we are prohibited to sit at a table where alcohol is being served. So my question is, do I have to go there with my parents or can I just stay at home without visiting my relatives? But if I do not visit them, will it make my, will I break my family ties? Okay. Which I know is a big sin. I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Asif from Saudi. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. My question is, uh, if a uh, mosque is very nearby and I must go for prayer to mosque only, and if I'm very late uh, to sleep at uh, night, uh, can I plan to pray at uh, home only for, um, because today I'm very, very late. In, in different places, can we plan this way or no? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. And uh, Ahna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu If there's a person who has constant negative thoughts from shaitan, like there are some facts that we know that this cannot be contradicted. Every Muslim believes it and it's basic, but Shaitan just tells that person, yeah, it, said, it says here so and so, but here happens so and so. There might be a contradiction, but that, and that person doesn't have any contact with a scholar, so can he just ignore those? Because he knows that those are the basics. Okay. Um, I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Ahmed from the UK. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is, Sheikh, uh, regarding um, the intention uh, for tayammum, there's one, because uh, the, the conditions for tayammum, like uh, the khul al for example, for each tayammum that they make, do they have to intend, uh, like in their head, this is the whole time um, I'm going to perform tayammum, and this is another condition uh, if water is available. And why you shouldn't use it? Um, do they have to intend this all in their head before making tayammum, or do they just simply do tayammum? I will answer, inshallah. Abdurrahman from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Sheikh, can we make dua in the prostration of obligatory pairs? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. 
and Benjamin from the UK. Benjamin. Benjamin from the UK. Okay, Sadiqa from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. We know music is haram, but in our mobile phone we use ringtone. So can you please explain me which kind of ringtone we can use in our mobile phone? Okay, I will answer inshallah. And Ibrahim from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu I, I don't hear you, Akhi. Uh, الله لك هذا البرنامج بالإنجليزي. عاد إذا كان بالعربي تصل على التلفون وشكرني رحم الله والديك. Um, Zadid from Bangladesh. Zadid. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa Labib from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, um, as we have seen from many of your videos that playing games are permissible, providing they're halal. Now, the question comes uh, some of the people are saying that. Uh, playing uh, the video games with a halal are exactly same like playing with the dice in a sense that you don't do any hard work or you don't do anything so they um, say it is akin, akin to both or same same thing now as they also um, t say about the opinion of Sheikh Ibn Taymin about uh, playing with cards uh, he as he also say the playing cards and playing dice are the same thing so can you please explain that Sheikh Okay, I will answer inshallah. And Halima from France. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam to Allah. Yeah, um, I would like to have more details about um, Ayat al Kursi and um, Surah um, Ayat al Manadri Rukia. I was told we have to stop at each verse and spit um, into the water, but I'm unable to. I'm unable to recognize which verses. I want more details about where to stop and spit into the water during Rukia days. Okay, I will answer, inshallah. And we have Latifa from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Assalamu I would like to know what is the ruling on eating in eating in a Muslim home restaurant that serves shisha, but they have a different section for things like that. Okay, I will answer inshallah. And we have Shihab from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Sheikh, while playing in congregation, when should we start rising from Rukur after the Imam fully says Sami Allah, Liman Hamida, or just after the Sami Allah, or just after we listen the words? Okay, I will answer inshallah. And Muhammad from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Sir, we have a matwatar hadith, La ilaha illallah. So, uh, why you extend Muhammad Rasulullah with La ilaha illallah? Because La ilaha illallah is hadith. And extension Muhammad Rasulullah away from that. Are you Muslim? Yes. And you don't know where we got Muhammad Rasulullah from? But hadith is just La ilaha illallah, full stop. And does that mean that Muhammad is not Rasulullah or it's no, embedded? No, Muhammad is Rasulullah. Muhammad is Rasulullah. But hadith is just la ilaha illallah. This is Matwatar hadith. So there is no hadith where the Prophet says, Ana Rasulullah. That's it? Okay, hadith is, but. Do you, uh, have, any beef? Do you have any beef with the statement that Muhammad is Rasulullah? Do you have no. any problem with that? No. Khalas, alhamdulillah. Uh, Hashim from Saudi. Hash uh, yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Hashim, uh, we lost Hashim. Abdurrahman from the UK. 
Hello. Abdurrahman from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Sanatullah. Um, just ha I just have a question in regards to when we say, for example, with a Nebi, we say uh, alayhi salam, or with a um, companion, we say uh, may Allah be pleased with them. Is this all interchangeable? So with a scholar, if we say um, that's passed away, if we say may Allah have mercy on them. Is this all interchangeable? So can I say with a scholar, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them? Or okay. is it set? I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Muhammad from the Philippines. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Hi, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. What can I do for you? My question, Sheikh, is Sheikh, can I recite any dua while doing work here? And are there any authentic duas in that can be recited in doing work here? Or is it only limited in reciting Surah Al Fatiha, Al Kursi, and the rest? I don't understand the word of what you had said. Can Sheikh, you, can, can I recite any dua while doing work here? While doing work here? Yes, can I recite any dua or is it only limited in Ayatul Kursi or Surah Al Fatiha and the rest? So, what kind of dua you want to make for the person you're making ruqya for? for? Yes, Sheikh. Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Salheen from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, in uh, Sayyid al Istighfar, when we recite Wa ana ala ahdika wa ahdika mastatu'at, uh, what is being referred to by uh, Ahd and Wa'd? Okay, I will answer inshallah. And we have Faizan from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Yes, Sheikh, actually, I have a question. Uh, we are actually dismantling our old house. So we are going to, to plan a new house, uh, to make a new house. But my, and here my parents are saying that we have to put, uh, we have to give first azan or we have to do some sacrifices or we have to, uh, or we have to uh, call someone who is more religious and he will put first stone. Is it permissible from Islam or, or not? Okay, and I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Abdus Samir from Pakistan. Abdus Samir. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Alaikum salam. Hayak Allah. Yes, sir. Allah. Sheikh, I have a question. There is a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. So if first of all, if this hadith is uh, is uh, then uh, like because I'm a university person and I like to keep uh, track of my expenses, expenses. So even the smallest thing, I like to I like to take a note that this cost this much and etc. So um, can you please like, advise me such that? Should I Okay, I will, inshallah. Rashad from Tunisia. Hayyak Allah. Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, rahimahullah, said, Man mata lahu qareeb, wa ya'alam annahu la yusalli, annahu la yusalli lahu an yakhda'a al-nas, wa'ati bihi, ilayhi min yusallu alayhi. Hypothetically, my dad died. I can pray on him? Okay, I will say, I will answer, inshallah. And Akbar from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Akbar? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, in some Western countries, if we go on study visa, we are only permitted to work for 20 hours per week. Most probably, we need to agree on this to get visa. If we work more than 20 hours and take cash to hide the income from government, is this income halal? So, this is in the country you're in? No, I'm, I'm trying to get visa, so I'm asking. Uh, is it permissible or not? Now, who's requesting 20 hours of work? No, Sheikh, it is permitted only 20 hours per week uh, in, to, in that country, like London and all. Okay, so you work 20 hours as a student, and then you work another 20 hours being paid against the law. This is what you're asking about? Yes. I will sure. answer you, inshallah. Uh, we have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. 
Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the ummah of his virtues no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me among the benefits of this narration it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them, is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, Al-Bani ruled it authentic in his book, Sahih Al-Jami'. The explanation of As-Sindi on the book of Ibn Majah and At-Taysir, Bisharh Al-Jami' As-Saghir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Brother Hamza from Bosnia, Herzegovina, says that he has relatives who live 20, 30 kilometers away. When he goes with his parents, they usually drink alcohol and there's free mixing. Should he go? The answer is definitely not. This is totally prohibited. Wouldn't I be severing my ties of kinship? The answer is no, again. Connecting your ties of kinship does not mean that you go and engage in something that Allah has prohibited or be part of a people who are cursed by Allah. Those who drink intoxicants, wine, beer, etc. and they sit together, they are cursed by Allah Azza wa You must not go, even if your parents are angry with you. So how would I connect to my kinship? Either you go to them separately because it seems that when you go with your parents, it's a family gathering. So they all gather. But if you go and visit each one alone, that wouldn't happen. The free mixing and, 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 and uh, abusing uh, booze, etc. Or you can simply call them on the phone or uh, have a video conference with them just to uh, patch things up. Asif from Saudi Arabia, he says, sometimes I go to bed really late due to work, due to whatever. And I know that if I were to wake up for Fajr prayer, I would be drowsy, uh, disoriented, blah, blah, blah. So can I fix my alarm uh, clock to, let's say, 20 minutes before sunrise? So I would get as much sleep as possible and then pray. Akhi, this is not permissible, generally speaking. Because this is the difference between believers and hypocrites. The hypocrites find Fajr and Isha to be difficult to offer on time. And they delay and postpone. And when they come to prayer, they come lazy. But if there is a real need for that, and it's once every like couple of years that you may feel the need to do this, inshallah, and I hope and I pray that this is permissible. Otherwise, no, you have to force yourself. And to attend the prayer in such a state 
is better than to delay it if it's reoccurring. But if it's once every blue moon, inshallah, there's nothing wrong in that. Uh, okay. Ahna from Bangladesh says, um, I have these intrusive whispers of shaitan telling me things about articles of Iman, about issues that I have full conviction and no doubt in. So can I ignore it? Can I ignore these whispers? That says definitely yes. And this is what I tell my people when we have counseling sessions, especially those who have intrusive thoughts. You are responsible for opening the door for Satan. Have you locked the door? Satan would not have these intrusive thoughts coming to your head, but you opened the door. And I give the example, which is very, very uh, uh, up to the point with the grace of Allah. If you go to the market in a poor country, will there be beggars? The answer is yes. While you're walking across the market, a child comes to you and says, uncle, uncle, give me some rupees, give me some uh, change. Uh, my father is starving. My mother needs medication. We, we don't have anything. Please help me, help me. If you give that child beggar some change, what will happen next? 20 other beggars would swarm you, probably take your wallet, take your watch, whatever, because they're, you, you'll be overwhelmed by them. You can't do anything. Whose mistake was it? Yours. Had you walked in a steady pace without looking at the boy, without paying any attention as if he's nothing, he's not there, he would have walked with you 10 steps and then moved on to another potential customer, feasible customer, because you're hopeless. And no one else would come because they know that, okay, he's hopeless. It's the same thing with shaitan. This is how shaitan works. Ahmed from the UK, he says, and I've noticed from his question that he's asking according to the fiqhi madhab he's learning. So in his school of thought, they say that you cannot perform tayammum except after the time is due. And this tayammum has to be for this particular prayer. And once the prayer time is expired and the following prayer is due, you have to perform another tayammum. And this is not right. This is bogus. Yes, Sheikh, but it is in our school of thought, fiqh books. Yeah, I know, but it's baseless. Neither the Quran nor the Sunnah backs it up. So what is the ruling? Akhi, you don't need the time to be due to perform wudu, uh, to perform tayammum. So if it's like 10 o'clock in the morning and I'd like to pray duha, I would make tayammum. Do I have to intend duha? No. I just intend, like when I do with wudu, to uplift my minor ritual impurity. I pray duha and I stay until duhr time. The duhr time is due. I pray duhr with the same tayammum. No need to make another tayammum. But I didn't intend the sheikh. No need. Who said there's need? Asr time is due. I pray asr with the same wudu. Come on. You don't do another wudu? Uh, another tayammum? No, I don't have to. The only time I have to stop tayammum is when the water is present or my ability to use the water is uh, there and I can use water. Only then my tayammum would be invalid and Allah knows best. Uh, Sadiqa says, uh, what about ringtones that we have on our mobiles? Because most of the ringtones are music. The answer is yes. But all mobiles have granny's phone or the old ring phone. So if there is no difference of tunes, so there's no do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, or a, b, c, d, e, f, as the, 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 the ladder itself, and there's no exchange of minor G, uh, uh, sharp, or whatever, then it's a one ring, like Granny's old dial phone. This is halal. But when there is a music to it, or a beat to it, this becomes haram and Allah knows best. Uh, Labib says, now some say that video games should take the same ruling as playing with dice because it 
has no value, it wastes time, blah, blah, blah. First of all, dice is prohibited because there is a hadith stating that it is prohibited without explaining why, whether it's gambling or not, whether you're playing backgammon as an easy uh, uh, game you're playing without any money, without any betting, it's still haram due to the uh, uh, presence of dice. So it has nothing to do with gambling or wasting time, etc. The hadith stated that it's haram. Video games, as stated before, if it's halal, if it's entertaining, if there's nothing haram in it, there's nothing wrong in playing it. When it comes to cards and some of the shuyukh, and he quoted Sheikh Ibn Uthameen saying that it's similar to dice, this is his opinion, may Allah have mercy on him. The hadith stated dice and did not justify why. Playing cards, a lot of the scholars say that it is prohibited. So whether you're playing bridge or playing uh, a tricks or playing the local game, which is balot or playing whatever uh, uh, you are uh, uh, playing with the cards, the majority say that it's haram because of waste, it is waste of time. Some scholars like Sheikh al-Albani says it's okay, providing it ha doesn't have any pictures. So the king, queen, and jacks, if you try to uh, put liquid paper on them so that you cover the faces, then if you play like half an hour or an hour a day without jeopardizing your commitment to Islam, to prayer, to your mom, to your job, to your studies, it's just recreational. He says, there's nothing wrong in it. And I'm inclined to that opinion. But when it comes or it changes into becoming an obsession, will you find someone having a deck of cards in his pocket, wherever he goes, ah, let's play, let's play. Or it involves gambling or it involves obscenity and profanity and bad words where we see people fight and curse and lie and cheat. No, this becomes haram. So this is a difference of opinion among scholars and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Halima from France says, now when we recite Ayat al-Kursi and the last two verses of Surah al-Baqarah, Amin al-Rasul, when to blow, you recite the Fatiha three times. The first time, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, till غير المغضوب عليه مرضالين, one. You recite it again, again. Three times, this is, these are, this is a set. Then you recite Ay Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illu hayu qayyum wa huwa al-alil azim. Recite it again and blow a third time and blow. Amara rasulu bima unzi ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. Till the end of the second ayah. And you blow. Recite the two ayahs again. Blow. Recite the two ayahs again. And blow. Then the last set is the three quls. You blow. The set, recite it again, you blow, recite it for the third time, and you blow. Latifa says, is it permissible to eat in a restaurant? It's, it's supposed to be an Islamic restaurant, meaning that the food is Islamic. But they have a section for hookah, or shisha, or ma'asil, or whatever they call it, where the people go and smoke hubbly bubbly or whatever they call it. So can we dine in such places? The answer is yes. There's no prob problem in that as long as they have a section for those sinners to do their sin away from you. Shihab from Bangladesh. When we are praying behind the Imam, when sh should one raise his head from rukur? So I'm in the rukur position. Subhana Rabbil Azim, Subhana Rabbil Azim, wa bihamdih. I hear the Imam says, saying, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Now, if I can sense the Imam, he's just next to me or in front of me. Once he is standing erect, this is where I stand erect. Whether he finished saying, Sami Allahu liman hamida or not. If I can't see him or sense him, so I would not move my head or my back until he finishes saying, Hamidah. This is when I start to rise up, and Allah knows best. Muhammad from Pakistan again repeats the same uh, uh, allegation that 
before him so many people come and say, how do you say Muhammadur Rasulullah? And in Islam, it's only Ashhadu Anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. You cannot say Muhammadur Rasulullah without Ashhadu. And I'm, I don't know why these people waste their time. I know that some people just want to be famous and they would say anything to be famous or to be heard on TV. But sometimes it becomes irritating. Question, is Muhammad the messenger of Allah? Yes or no? I said yes. So do you have any beef with me saying Muhammad Rasulullah? No, you have to say Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So what? La ilaha illallah. There's no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. Is it accepted? He said, yes. There's a hadith stating this. What does it mean? It means that I bear witness. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. So if you omit Ashhadu, does it change the fact? No. So why are you so anxious about saying Muhammad Rasulullah? What was the seal of the Prophet ﷺ where he used to stamp his letters to the kings? What was written on it? Muhammad Rasulullah. Ah, you should change this. Oops, it's in the history books and the hadith books. Uh, okay, Sheikh, I think you've cornered us. Let us look for some other justification. We'll give you a call next week and bug you again and again and again. This is ridiculous. Either you're doing it for the sake of Allah and you're not. Because if you're doing it for the sake of Allah, it has to be backed by the Quran and the Sunnah. Not just because an, a, 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 someone who's unknown, an anonymous person on the internet or WhatsApp sent you a message saying one of the greatest faults in our modern times is the vaccine and saying Muhammad Rasulullah, this is blasphemous. And you go ahead and ride the tide, ride the wave. This is ridiculous. So I hope these people give us a break. Abdurrahman from the UK. He says, can we interchange, alternate between saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Alayhi Salam for the prophets and messengers and may Allah be pleased with him, radiallahu an for the companions and rahimahullah for the scholars. So can we interchange or alternate? The answer is yes, but this is not the norm. So can we say, oh, uh, brother uh, Ahmed, alayhi salatu wassalam. No problem. You can say that. But this is not the norm. Can we say, Sheikh bin Baz, radiyallahu anhu? Yeah, you can say that. Can we say, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, rahimahullah? You can say that. This is not the norm. People acknowledge that peace and praise of Allah is due upon the messengers and the prophets. Though it can be used with normal people as the prophet himself Islam, used it with one of his companions or a, few, a, a, a number of his companions. But this is not the norm. Likewise, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. We can say it to scholars, we can say it to companions, we can say it, it's asking Allah to have mercy on that individual. There's no problem. Radiyallahu an, this is, may Allah be pleased with them, a description that was mentioned in the Quran about the companions. But it's a dua. So I, when I say to, uh, or talk about my father and I say, radiyallahu an, may Allah be pleased with him. This is dua like, may Allah have mercy on him, may Allah expand his grave and so on. But this is not the norm, Allah knows best. Muhammad says from the Philippines, can we do dua during ruqya? First of all, what is ruqya? Ruqya is a set of verses of the Quran, a set of hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, a set of Arabic words of dua. So I can recite Al-Fatiha as Ruqya. I can recite Allahumma Rabban Nas Adhib al Bas Washfi Anta Shafi La Shifa illa Shifauk Shifa Allah Yuhadiru Sakama, a well known hadith. And I can recite Allahumma Mashfihi, Allahumma Afihi, Allahumma Adhib al Dura Ladi Masahu. These are my words. No problem. But the problem is if you're reciting Ruqya and in between you say, Oh Allah, pay off my debts. Oh Allah, grant me a new 
Porsche. Oh, excuse me, what are you doing? Said Sheikh said it's okay to make dua. Make dua as ruqya, not make dua in otherworldly things, and Allah knows best. Salihin from Canada, he says in Sayyidul Istighfar, what is meant by Wana ala ahdika wa ba'dika mastata'tu? I, according to my ability, O oh Allah, I am on the pledge of worshipping you and believing in you as you've commanded and your promise to grant those who do this paradise and to grant who fail to do this hellfire. I believe in this promise and I'm abiding by the covenant that I'm committed to of worshipping you to the best of my ability because I cannot fulfill it 100%. But this is up to the best of my ability and Allah knows best. Fizan from India, he says that their father is, or their family is moving from their old house to a new house. But his family, his father especially, is saying that we have to recite certain things in the house such as the adhan and to offer sacrifice and to bring a maulana to read dua and maybe hang few things or stones or ta'viz or uh, uh, amulets. So is this part of the sunnah? The answer is no. All of these are not permissible. It's not part of the sunnah. The only thing is that you recite in the new house and not before you move in, even after you move in, Surah Al-Baqarah. This is part of the sunnah and the rest is not. And it may take you uh, um, even worse to things that are related to shirk. Putting ta'viz or uh, amulets in the house, thinking that this protects it, slaughtering a sacrifice and taking the blood and putting it on the foundations or the steps of the house, all of this is shirk. Abdul Samir from Pakistan, the hadith where the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, do not count, so Allah would not count over you, and do not um, how do you say it? Close the container and make it tight so that Allah would not make things tight over you. Does this go against having a spreadsheet or an Excel sheet where I record my expenses and my income just to monitor how much I've spent and how much I can plan? The answer is no. The hadith is specific towards a category of the companions of the Muslims whom the Prophet ﷺ was elevating their level of Iman and Tawakkul. So in one incident, he gave Aisha a certain bag or container. He gave Abu Hurairah a certain bag or container with food in it. And he gave Asma bint Abi Bakr a certain pot or something like that. And he told, generally speaking, but all of them that don't count, don't weigh how much is left and spend in the cause of Allah without counting. Abu Huraira, for example, kept on spending from that container for years. And so did Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. And I don't recall uh, Asma what happened. This, uh, I'm, I'm remembering this vividly. If I knew that this uh, uh, right to the letter, I would be with the major scholars, not sitting here. So they said that after so many years, something happened and just out of curiosity, we weighed what's remaining because we've been spending like crazy and, and it's still full. And the baraka went and it got uh, uh, through. So the hadith means that if you spent without notice, noticing how much is left for the cause of Allah, Allah will put barakah in it. And this is why one of the seven who will be in the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment is one who gave out to charity with his right hand, in another hadith with his left hand, where the other hand does not know how much he spent, meaning he just took a bunch and gave it. He doesn't know how much he gave. Trusting Allah, not like us opening the wallet and seeing how much and we choose the worst bill 
we have that is torn and uh, uh, not looking good and giving it to the poor. No, this guy just takes whatever he can and gives it for the sake of Allah. Allah puts barakah in it. But is it wrong, Sheikh, to have a spreadsheet or to have a, an Excel sheet with my expenses? There's nothing wrong in that. It's halal. Is it the best thing to do? Mm, maybe, but um, it's up to your preference. Rashad from Tunisia. Now he says, Sheikh Ibn Uthimin says that if someone knows that this person doesn't pray, he must not cheat the people and he must warn them not to pray funeral prayer after his death. We've been through this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you will probably find a lecture called The Great Debate. And this was done in Birmingham when I was allowed to go there nine years ago, 10 years ago. It was a debate, but it, it was a, uh, not a debate, it was a dialogue between Dr. Bilal Phillips, Abu Amina, may Allah preserve him, and myself, about the ruling on a person who does not pray. The conclusion was that there, are, there is a theoretical aspect and a practical aspect. The theoretical aspect is anyone who doesn't pray is a kafir. Boom. The uh, uh, a practical aspect is let's implement this in today's world. I cannot go and say, okay, my father doesn't pray. So he's a kafir. How do you know? I haven't seen him pray. Okay, this is practical. Do you know if he doesn't, if he prays or not when you are in the masjid? No, but most likely, ah, most likely, this doesn't count. This is bogus. This is doubtful. He may pray when you're in the bathroom. He may pray when you're in the masjid. He may pray when you're alone, uh, when you're asleep at night. You never know. So unless he confesses and says, I don't pray, I don't believe in praying, and the conditions of taking him out of the fold of Islam are fulfilled. So he's not ignorant, he's knowledgeable. He's not forced, he is willingly doing it. He doesn't have any misinterpretation. Rather, he knows exactly what's going on. Other than that, you cannot claim that he's a kafir. His fate is with Allah Azza wa Jal. And definitely you cannot go to people and say, oh, my, da my dad died as a kafir, don't offer funeral prayer because this is not right. Finally, Akbar from India, he says, when I go to study in the UK or in Europe, they allow me to work for 20 hours a week, which is a part time. And this doesn't pay the bills. So I work against the law without, without them know, knowing and receive cash money from my employer more than 20 hours so that I can make ends meet. Is this permissible? The answer is no. This is haram because you are not abiding by the laws of the country which you've signed the visa form stating to abide by it. Is my income haram? The answer is no, your income is halal. You worked in cleaning and mopping the floors of a school. This is halal work. You're being paid for your work. This is halal earning, but you're sinful for disobeying the authorities and for breaking the law by defying their agreement with you. And Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow Sunday after Asr prayer about four o'clock here in uh, uh, Mecca region. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين